Okay, hello and welcome to Eastern Marshlands channel. This is the book club. And tonight with me is not TK because TK is on the leave for this week. And this week we will have a guest. His name is Max from uh, Crossroads server. Hello, Max. How's it going? Uh, hello, it's going pretty good. What's going on? Okay, so tonight we will be discussing George Orwell's A Monster Catalonia. We will talk about Spanish Civil War. We'll talk about many stuff that is connected to George Orwell as a socialist. And uh, it's, it will be a pretty cool discussion. We'll go um, chapter by chapter discussing A Monster Catalonia. But first, let me do a couple of announcements and shout outs. First and foremost, we're really close to 200 subs. So if you on YouTube, so if you are. If you're watching this, please consider subscribing. Uh, we will have a little special video, and we are planning something big for October Revolution in two months. I will instantly announce uh, the next book that we'll be talking next month. It will be Towards New Socialism by Paul Cockshot and Ellen Cartel. Uh, it will be... We will have a like it was it would be a more serious book than you, this one because it, it will go deep into uh, their proposals of what the socialism of twenty first century may look like, how the socialist uh, structures look like if we put into the system um, the modern technologies. So uh, I'd like to also say hi to the chat. I, I see you there. Well, if you have any questions or thoughts, please share them there. We'll, we will, I'm watching the chat. And uh, this book, Towards New Socialism, we'll talk about is on 8th of September, around the same time as now. Um, it's pretty good. Um, Paul Cockshot is a really interesting uh, person. He's a professor of, econo of economics in uh, some Scottish university. I think, I think, yeah, he's, he's from Scotland. He's a professor. He's a really interesting dude. Uh, and he has some really interesting ideas uh, and criti critiques of uh, socialist um, countries that existed in the 20th century. Also, I would like to give a shout out to our Patreons. Um, it is a creamy bowl of tomato soup, Ali uh, Al Vazan, and Comrade Gultsov. We love you very much. Uh, I hope you will be getting the. Um, Getting your medals and your little badges soonish, I hope. The mail won't fail us. And uh, let me know when you get them. Okay, so also shout out to Crossroad Discord server. We, I love you. you. It's a really cool server. You should check it out. They, there are people of completely different political uh, ideologies. There are a bunch of right winners, a bunch of left winners. It's pretty cool. Um, I recommend it. It's pretty cool. Also, a shout out to uh, the youcaring.com uh, project called um, Cafe Zapatista. If you don't know, it's a really interesting thing. Basically, a bunch of uh, Antifa comrades from California getting money to uh, fund the little project. They are planning to buy some coffee from Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, and give it out in protests, uh, promoting uh, Zapatistas, promoting Antifa movement, and uh, all the money that they will be getting in tips during the events will be getting to building schools in Chiapas, Mexico. So it's pretty cool. Shout out to them. Um, is there anything else? Yo, subscribe to our SoundCloud and iTunes and message us in on our email, uh, emailpodcast at gmail.com. My Twitter is at email Eugene. All the links are in the description. Uh, check them out. So... Uh, let's get to the Spanish Civil War, shall All we? Right. <clears throat> so, so I think it is a very important event in the 20th uh, century because yes, it's it's very weird. It was one of the biggest. Um, it one was one of the biggest uprisings of anarchists, precisely, and uh, yes. it was one of those um, events when anarchists actually made a huge rev huge gains and they have created an anarchist state so mm -hmm. <laughs> so called anarchist state anarchist territory and they have done tremendous work yes and i, I think it is amazing what's what are your feelings about the whole the whole spanish thing the whole spanish civil war thing the spanish civil war thing i think um 
is very in line with a lot of the um, more anarchistic principles as opposed to more the Marxist Leninist ones, um, mainly in the fact that, you know, Marxist Leninists usually um, rely heavily on dialectics and um, their material approach, but anarchists have always been in support of the more ideological approach of the spontaneous uprising, the spontaneous mm-hmm. revolution. And I think that it actually during at least the first year showed a very um a very dedicated and ardent approach to this uh type of revolution because you know at the time they were not as heavily reliant on marx as they were more along the lines of bakunin and proudhon and these were mm-hmm. the main thinkers that were spread around you also have to realize that Spain at this time was largely um, illiterate. So when yeah. they started printing these um, mass, mass, uh, mass printing the uh, works that they were trying to give people, they also had to teach people how to read at the same time. So they were getting an education along with their education. They were becoming class conscious yeah. along with their um, um, political uh, understanding of the world. So... This is actually well, the reason why, like, the posters, the propaganda posters, was such a big deal in Spanish Civil War. Like, yeah. because the populace was really illiterate, or will also reference to it in a book. Basically, they printed a lot, a lot <clears> of <throat> those posters, which are colorful and really cool. And uh, people could really recognize letters, so they saw, like, C and T. They knew that there were anarchists, and, like, they they know they knew the political parties. Like Orwell said uh, in the book, basically, the only thing that people... Um, every single person in Spain could answer you the two things, their name and their political party. <laughs> like yeah. everyone belonged to some sort of political movement or party. Everyone knew this, and uh, this is why they could see the, um, the those posters. If you Google Spanish Civil War posters, you will see a lot of them on fascist side, on Republican side, uh, anarchist, yes. socialist. It's really cool. I'm actually thinking about choosing one and printing it out and sticking up the wall because some of them are really cool. Oh yeah, it's really great cool. art. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, it's it's really interesting because at the same time it was a very agricultural country, yes. Like, uh, and um, it was heavily, um, it was really heavily uh, feudal. Still, it was really just filled with landowners. For the wealth, of... for them to do what they did, considering how they lived and where they lived, and the fact that well, mm-hmm. Spain, for the most part. A large part of Spain is very, um, very mountainous and also barren. So yeah, I, it was it was an amazing, it was an amazing. Um, I mean, what would the word be? It was an amazing, amazing insurrection. It was an amazing. The word yes. you're looking for, yeah. The whole, yes, the whole idea it, that it would happen there and it was quite successful. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't as successful in terms of military, but it was really successful yes. in social and economical gains they created. They purged. Yes, yeah. you essentially had entire swaths of the population were so class conscious that it was, even though they lacked many provisions that were necessary, many, um, um, they had a lot of scarcity in terms of not just ammunition, but even food. And they still managed to um, have at least three major political parties in resistance to uh, Franco and not just Franco, but the other imperialist factions um, that were trying to suppress them. Uh, And it's really a testament to the human will, if you think about it. I mean, you could, I guess you could say it was it was ideologically driven. It was seeing as that how anarchists uh, usually are not uh, as into the whole Marxist dialectics thing. Even if you're just going to look at it, well, they were just utopian socialists. Uh, even even if you're going to look at it that way, what they accomplished was still amazing. Yeah, it's really interesting because many people blame each other for this war, like the reason why it failed. Some people directly blame fascists and the fact that they had got heavy <coughs> support from uh, 
fascist Italy and Germany. Some people blame communists. Some people blame uh, Poom and anarchists. And like, it's all the blame that goes all those ways. You know, it's really, it's really a complex thing because all of those things were the reason why the war failed. Like, yeah, it's it's really interesting because. Many people expected the war to be successful, especially in the first part. Like you can see when you read the book, everyone was really, really revolutionist. Like people were really class conscious. They were really aiming to for revolution. They made a lot of gains. But then, especially after May days, days in May, uh, when this whole deal with the communists seizing the how it's called it was the um, telephone exchange. They would seize the telephone exchange, basically seizing the, the main uh, communication between um, people who used to belong to work as it became under direct control of the Communist Party. And we see this is when it was like a turn in the mood. People were like you started to see poverty, you started to see people dressing in like bourgeois clothes, people going to the um, to the seaside, you know, all of this stuff, or very like bourgeois stuff. And yeah. uh, even the world said that it will be some sort of fascism anyway. Like you said, either it will <laughs> be Franco or it will be like really strict uh, control by the party, communist party. So like it will be it will be bad, you said. But nothing is bad as fascist, so he keep t kept on fighting. And when you read the book, right. it's really weird. Like I f had a, this feeling that before that, you, you see that they are in miserable conditions, everything is really terrible. But after that, when he came back and he fought in the ranks of popular army, he uh, because Poom was banned, mm -hmm. he... Uh, he was still fighting, and you read it, but you're like already, oh fuck! You already have this feeling that it's useless. Like it's silly, but you have this feeling that oh shit! Like it's really fucked. The situation is fucked. If you if you don't remember, if you don't even think that actually Franco won, you still <laughs> feel sad and uh, demoralized. But he still writes that like you see that he thought that. The war should be fought. This fight is a good fight. Yeah. Yes. Okay, there was a question in chat. Uh, were there any monarchists in the Spanish Civil War? And besides Marxism and anarchism, what forms from socialism and communism were there? Shall we go through the main participants in the conflict? I think so. I think that would be Yeah, helpful. let's do that and then move to the book and the events. So basically, there were two sides, the Republican side and the Nationalist side. Uh, yeah. The Republican side were the loyalists. They were the ones who were doing a lot of like social democracy. They were doing a lot of good stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, then the insurrection by the Nationalists started. So one of the biggest forces in the Republican side was CNT, FII, an alliance of two anarchist uh, trade unions. In the book, yeah. they are referred to as trade unions, CNT, FII. Uh, they were the anarchists. They were the ones who were putting the power into the control of the workers. They were the ones who started the revolution in Barcelona. And yes. um, they were um, a democratic trade unions. So this is the first. Are there, is there anything else you want to mention about them? Um, I mean, that pretty much covers pretty it. Much you said it. he wanted to know about like the monarchists. Yeah, the monarchists, and, yeah, let's finish, there, I'm not really sure, there were some monarchist people, but let's first go through largely, the Republicans. Yeah. Largely the church, if you're going to talk about, like, clergymen or whatever, the church was largely in support of Franco. I mean, they had a lot of problems with clerical fascism, so. Um, because, yeah, maybe, this is why those people were shooting the, um, the, cl the clergy all the time. They were... Yeah led it up against the wall and shot because they were the people who agitated for fascism. They were the ones who uh, were the symbol of authoritarian rule that yeah. the left fought all this time. Yes. And they, they were found guilty for the promoting fascism. A lot of them were loyal to the nationalists because they were really closely connected to the landowners and landowners really benefited from traditional uh, ultra right wing Franco's government uh, and they were like yes. okay we should support them. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I would say that it would be there ridiculous were to kids. say. I, I would say there it would be ridiculous to say that there were no um, religious or um, monarchist influences in the in all camps because there were. But I just don't think that when you're talking about the CNTFAI or the uh, Republican Army that it was really that big of. Um, that big of an influence, I think, because mm-hmm. largely they were trying to reject the clerical influence that they had over the um, that the clergy had over the um, cultural hegemony. They just it was mainly about the reactionary forces versus the um, insurrectionary forces. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, from what I see, there was this whole movement called uh, Communion Tradicionalista. I'm very sorry for just doing my terrible Spanish. Uh, Basically, those people were associated with the whole uh, restoration movement. And a lot of them supported the restoration of monarchy. And they fought in the ranks of fascists. And uh, from what I see, there were around six... Uh, 60,000 60, volunteers uh, in the fascist army from this organization. And they were mostly, uh, mostly, um, most of them were recruited in the army and they were an, sort of like a political force uh, in 36, 37. So, th- and the flag, the, this whole, you know, white flag with this red cross, the monarchist flag, it was mm. used by a fascist a lot. Like, I'm not really sure whether they really were for restoration of monarchy, because as we know, the, the what Franco did is he, um, he abolished monarchy. And while he was in charge, the Spanish king was in exile. So... Yeah. When he was when he retired in the seventies, I guess was it somewhere around seventies? I think um, they um, he restored monarchy and then he went away. And so, like, actually, this is the reason why many people, when they start this whole um, recruitment thing into the fascism, they mention Franco as like a good fascist and as the one who restored monarchy and went away peacefully. When, mm. when his time came. So, like, wow. when they want to That's... apologize. Yeah, like, he went away peacefully. There were protests, but he, like, he, yeah, I'll rest the monarchy and be on my way. There and uh, apolog- people who apologize for fascism, like, they mention Franco a lot. And this is what is mentioned a lot when people want to apologize for fascism. Yeah. But, yeah, this is the main thing about it. Yeah, there were other forces there. Mostly there were crazy reactionary confederations of right-wing groups, so um, Spanish Confederation of Autonomous Right-wing Groups, so-called. It was uh, a political party, like those were the Catholic conservatives, um, very strong yeah. representation there. <clears throat> there were also yeah. um, Renovación Española, monarchist political party. Again, they wanted to, there were right-wing authoritarian monarchists. And all of them were dissolved in the end of the 30s, most of them at least. Yeah, in the, at the end of 37, like yeah. they were mostly non existent and was <clears throat> just the fascist party. Well, you had that was many, led by Franco. You, you had many different groups on each side, and uh, there was some infighting on each side as well. But yeah. the, the reality of it is, is that you had it was the right wing versus the left. That yeah, pretty the much. Big, yeah. But we will and get into Stalin, infighting. Yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get into this part when we yeah. get to the events of the infighting on the left side uh, when we get to it in the book. So let's start f- with the first chapter. Uh, you can follow along uh, if you go to Homage to Catalonia page. I'll share in chat now. You can, uh, or you can just Google it. Um, you can follow along. We will go one by one, chapter by chapter. You can follow with us. So the book starts in December 1936, and when Orwell arrives to uh, Spain, he arrives to Barcelona. And this was Mm -hmm. already when the revolution was... So it was a year after the revolution started, basically. A year and a half, because it started in July 36. 
And um, yes. he describes the Catalo revolutionary Catalonia as... It's very interesting because he wasn't a socialist back then. He was sympathetic to socialism. But he just wanted to fight fascism. But period. Yeah, like, if you read it, he literally says that I came to Spain um, to fight fascism, not because of my political beliefs, but because of basic human decency. <laughs> yes. That's, an, <laughs> that's, a, that's basic, an awesome yeah. quote. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's really interesting that we talk about this book now, because um, Paul Joseph Watson has been really vocal about George Orwell recently. He has been uh... so... He has been so... Like, he has been mass tweeting about George Orwell's, uh, oh, Orwell's would be so furious, double thing of Antifa, haha, -ha, he would fought Antifa. And uh, people have been doing, basically, like, pointing out the existence of Amash de Catalonia and the fact that he fought fascism. Yeah, he was... the right-wingers <laughs> have this constant cognitive dissonance thing going on with Orwell, because they can yeah. use 1984 and Animal Farm as... Um, almost as political um, uh, rhetoric against, or propaganda against left-wing ideals, period. Completely forgetting and leaving out intentionally, um, lying by omission, if you will, the fact that <laughs> Orwell was a diehard democratic socialist, at least by the time um, that he was writing the books 1984 and Animal Farm. <laughs> Yeah, I remember yeah. there was a quote by George Orwell. Uh, let me find it directly because it's a really interesting quote where he describes his political beliefs, basically. Um, give me a second. Uh, it was... Okay, I, I should quote him directly because I don't think... Um, just... I don't want to murder his quote. Um, mm hmm Yes, here it is. Uh, yes, every line of serious work I have written since 1936 has been written directly or indirectly against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism, as I understand it. Yes. So basically, that, that sounds about right. This is basically what he was about. And I remember then when the Orwell's List was first published. And the full thing was published in, uh, when was it published? It was published in, um, soon after his death. Yeah. Because he wrote it in 1949. Uh, yeah, he handed it death. to the authorities um, just before he died. Yeah, basically people uh, write to newspapers in, um, in Britain wrote a, a lot about it. They were like, oh, shit, look at that. Like, let, let, let's murder just his everything that he did. Let's just put a cross onto it so that people would forget. Orwell, forget. The, Orwell the great betrayer of the left. Yeah, they wrote something <laughs> like, the um, oh, the, look at this um, person that people used to refer to, the left uh, honey boy that everybody loved. Like, mm -hmm. oh, look, he's a traitor. Like, and they just, this is what has started this whole amnesia thing in the media that he was uh, a left winger. Yeah. It's so weird. So he wrote about the Catalonian. He was really fascinated. He said that it was... And people who... He said that many people who may think that it wasn't workers-controlled territory. He said, well, it was. And it's really weird. Everything was controlled by the workers. No one was wearing any posh clothes, but no one was homeless or, like, poor, looked poor. Everybody wore, yeah. like, workers' clothes. They were walking around. Uh, everything was colored in black and red or red. Like, yes. there were posters all around. And it was a bit dirty. But, uh, like, there were papers all around, but it was normal. It's normal... He writes of it as a normal thing that happens when there is a revolution. There is a bunch yes. of paper everywhere. <laughs> yes, I would like to. I would like to add just before we get too far away from the topic we were just yeah. discussing that for or for right wingers to say that Orwell was on the right is an act of Orwellian resistance against freedom. <laughs> yes, <laughs> pretty much. I just love how we can how they mention it all the time and they just put themselves into a huge trap. 
But well, they, they, they. If you, if you'll notice, whenever they mention him, they never mention homage to Catalonia. It's as if the nah. book never existed. <laughs> and I love how Paul Joseph Watson just skips through it. He was like, "Yes, people on Twitter keep pointing out that the uh, there is homage to Catalonia. I've read it." Like, dude, if you would have read a to Catalonia, you would be really fucking like saying different shit about the whole shtick. Like, when you yeah. say, when you compare uh, anti authoritarian, mostly anarchist movement of anti fascist uh, action, and you say that those people are fascistic, this is what I would have heard on Twitter fascistic. It's just weird. Like, fuck me. You should. It's more complex than that. And he doesn't even point to the fact that communists uh, betrayed the anarchists. Mm-hmm. That all this infighting has started. Like, yeah. they don't mention it. They just, eh, George Orwell, double think. Haha, <laughs> freedom is well, uh, slavery. I, I would say that Antifa isn't necessarily um, reflective of socialism in the past. I feel that. Um, for one thing, there's a huge economic and um, political difference in the Americas, especially like in the area of Berkeley or whatever, in contrast to, say, Europe in the 60s, 70s, 80s, when you would have, like, um, essentially what we're seeing now with the rise of Antifa and more militant right-wing groups in America is is a, is a mock um, LARPing of what you would see in Europe. Oh, and, so you're you're quite critical of them. I'm I'm critical of them, um, just in the fact that I do not see that um, scaring the working class, beating up the working class, like I saw um, some Antifa members beating up this man and his son with these shields that said "No Hate." I found that to be very ironic. Uh, just because of the fact that it seems that maybe not in all cases, but in some cases they seem to let the situation get to them and they start to just like enjoy the action of it all. And maybe they should be a little more serious, I would feel, because being more scary than um, open or at least having a, having a, an air of open, openness would attract the public more. I think I think it just allows for the um, the right wingers to be able to brand well while well, socialists look like Antifa, you know, because of course Antifa does things like they feed the homeless, they house the homeless, they feed people, they do community organizing, they do a lot of good shit. But then you um, you just run into the problem of well, it's it's PR, it's it's relations with the public. Um, how do you? get people on your side. How do you scare the, the establishment without scaring the people as well? Like, mm-hmm. Because fascists usually attack um, groups of people that they don't agree with, um, as opposed to like, traditionally, the left wing attacks like the government, uh, banks, um, big businesses. <clears throat> I, I just see that... Yeah. I don't think they're going that way necessarily, but it looks like they're making it a little too easy to stray from yeah, the. I, um, I get that. Fr- yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the that's, way, about this, just my about this Antifa attacking this uh, father and son, um, people have been sharing this video and sending me this video on Twitter, and uh, I I haven't seen the full video. Right. I haven't seen what happened before that because they have been. Uh, constant uh, provocations. Uh, I'm not saying this was a provocation. I have no idea what happened because I haven't seen the full video, but there was a case when there was um, a dude, uh, 18-year-old, in a MAGA hat who Mm -hmm. pepper sprayed the black block, and then they attacked and beat the shit out of them. And there was a video (laughs) online of Antifa beating the shit out of the 18-year-old with a MAGA hat. They cut out the part of the of the pepper spraying. Another and lying so, another lying by omission case, yes. Exactly. So there have been there has been a lot of this and I believe that framing. Like, yeah. Yeah. A lot Just of Just be it. wary and of we, the media. Yeah, and I we gotcha. see that on fascist discords they have been saying that oh we should wear MAGA hats. Don't wear Pepe and stuff like this. 
where mm -hmm. Trump supporter shtick. I'm like, pose as either Democrats or uh, like normie Republicans do this, and this will like be better for us. And they have been doing it, and it's pretty scary because uh, now they can easily frame anyone. And you know what's also interesting? Because I've talked to uh, a good friend of mine, Bangan Marxist. He was on Bolshevik Bistro on stream some time ago. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, he's part of uh, Antifa movement. He was he's the one who's getting the money to give out Zapatista coffee that I mentioned in the first part of the stream. And yes. uh, he says that basically what the right wing does, they show up like all those patriot groups. They show up with a bunch of cameras. And they mm -hmm. film themselves constantly, and they film every single thing. Like there is a bunch of videos of the protests that um, he and his buddies were disrupting. Basically, they wanted to march, but they Antifa didn't allow them to. And uh, uh, he shared those videos with me, and we were watching them together. And um, he was like, oh, you see this on this frame? There is me going around. Yeah, that's me shouting at them <laughs> in the mask. Uh, and uh, I asked, is there a video that you made? Like, there is like mm -hmm. three hours from different angles like of everything on the right wing side. They film everything. So are there videos that you make? You know, no, we don't bring cameras. I ask, why? Because when police comes, they don't arrest the right wing. They arrest us. And what they do is confiscate mm. every single thing that we have. Phones, cameras, uh, anything uh -huh. they can find. Uh -huh. And yes. like, this is a problem. They can't film often anything because they get their shit confiscated. And mm. so it puts the whole thing into a position when, oh, um, why don't, like, is there anything we can do? Oh, no, we can't because we, the only proof is their content. Mm -hmm. Media doesn't <clears throat> show up on those events, which are multiple, like all of this Berkeley stuff, you know, all of this Charlottesville stuff. It's big. It's international. Yes. This is why the media is there. But when there are like 20 people, 20 Antifa, 50 uh, right-wingers, there are dozens of those protests every day all over the state, but nobody is filming them except for the right wing. And there is no media because there is like, why? Why would they show up? Uh -huh. Aha. So I see. Important. And so, like, it all puts I know, the left into the position where the only solution, like, to this, I will also add that people have been really critical of Antifa, not for the reason that they are all oh, bad beating up people, but oh shit, we, the left, are good at mobilizing, but not very good at organizing. You can easily like call up a bunch of comrades locally, gather up, and go beat the shit out of fascists, but you can't um, organize them as well as like we used to. Like We used right. to organize great, but now we don't have a political party, we don't have a political movement, we don't have a coherent program, except for, I guess, DSA, but those people are too decentralized and too doing their own thing to be a legitimate revolutionary power that can be so, disruptive and, uh, and revolutionary. So you're saying the only active insurrectionary force at the moment is Antifa. That's it. Well, they That's are the biggest ones, and they are the most active ones. I can't see... Like, the IWW is also good, and they are on the rise, but Antifa is, is a movement. It's a thing that has no labels. It, it's a thing that has no funding and has nothing. It has funding. People do try to gather money to organize shit, to have newspapers and uh, news sites. There are a bunch of anarchist Antifa news sites and projects that they do, but mostly it's, like, it's the biggest thing ever. Today in America, yeah. for example, like we say America is the biggest thing ever. Yes, it hit the I'm mainstream. Not, everybody talks about it. Yes, I'm not against um, left wing act activism. Uh, the only thing I am for is um, making sure that even though times are difficult, the fact of the matter is is that you're in a spotlight now with all the um, like you said, everyone has cameras except for you. So when it comes to behavior, yeah. I just feel that that is so important for PR, just because. If you want um, people to have um, empathy for you and not enmity against you um, or with you, it, it's just more helpful than not. Just to, you just have to be, mm -hmm. be critical of yourself more than anyone else, yeah. just because it's very important to lead by um, or, um, by your character and by your um, attributes in this country. 
Exactly, exactly. And I see chat is mentioning Redneck Revolt and Red Guards. Uh, I would like to point out Redneck Revolt is really good at that. Those they are very oh, yeah. they're good, very they're awesome. good group, and they have really cool community outreach, and uh, they are really good at communicating their goals, and uh, th that's why I just adore them. They are uh, they are really really fucking good, and um, yes, I, I, I believe like that. that more of that. We, and we see that this is emerging. People are getting out there and talking to people because, yeah, like I see people criticizing. I've seen, oh, the, there is one Trotskyist organization in Russia um, that I was following and I was really interested in them because they were the one of the only ones that have been really active in the media sphere. And you see that they are really like doing something and uh, communism in Eastern Europe is pretty much dead. Those people are trying to do something with it. And I was following them. And uh, the and uh, one day, I was like, when I really considered in my head, oh, I guess those guys are pretty cool. They write a piece on G20, and they were critical of Antifa for making us all look bad, quote unquote. Yes. And I'm like, well, dude, they are doing something. Mm. I mm. think it's far better than what you do because your events are like 10 people came and we did something yay it's like it's like australia they have the same thing it's like jeremy didn't show up well i guess we have nothing to do today like <laughs> there are like 10 people that's it yeah um i think but they, then again yeah but my point is say, that they shouldn't say, cut back on those things i think they should they should do the same thing but what they should do is do more in terms of outreach do more in terms of publicity uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. gotta have PR. Yeah, you do. Yeah, their PR is not that good. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't do what they do. It doesn't mean they should go around wrecking shit because wrecking shit gives you publicity. What you do with it is the question. But mm. uh, I really enjoy what Antifa does because uh, if you go beyond what hits the um, hits the um, the news, the mainstream news, mainstream yeah. media. You know, then you see that those guys are amazing. And uh, shout out to everyone who is participating in your local events, your local uh, organizations. Like, you're cool, do better, do like self create or die, and shit like this. <laughs> okay. Everything, is there anything else you wanted to mention, or should we go on with the book? We should go on with the book. We were getting sidetracked just a little, so let's continue. Yeah, but that's cool. It was a cool discussion. So, oh. uh, they are, this is the part when they are gathering and he joins the Pum mm. and they are off to Zaragoza. Basically, what Pum is, is uh, an anti-Stalinist, so not affiliated with Third International Marxist Party. Mm. And uh, what I should mention is they are not Trots, in the meaning that they were not affiliated with Trotsky or Fourth International. They were completely independent. They didn't follow the... Um, Trotsky's line. They were critical mm -hmm. of Soviet Union. They were not a uh, communist party. The, they were not affiliated with Soviet Union, but again, they, they were, were quite independent. They were Marxists. Yeah. Yes. And um, if you Google, if you go to my Twitter, this is the picture I was sending yesterday when I announced that we will be streaming today, yesterday, but I didn't uh, because of stuff. Basically, I, oh, I promised to say why. I got a second cat, and my cat, my original cat, was fighting with my new cat. And I was spending the day protecting a little kitten that is one and a half month old from my four, year, four month old cat. Yeah. <laughs> I was yep, stressing yep. out. I was really sad about it. And, uh, but they are starting to get alone. They're starting at least. So, yeah, I got you. I got you. It, it's good. So, there um, you go. Yeah. So, if you go to my Twitter, or you just Google Poom, you will see the picture of the Poom uh, militia people standing in the line with the, like a red flag with the hammer and sickle in the front. And you see a person who's back there with like um, long hair and uh, very, very tall right at the back. It's George Orwell, who's <laughs> standing in this. Yes in this um, line, and you can see that on the flag it says, uh, I can't see the whole Spanish word, uh, Caserine, Lenin, basically the, um, 
Lenin's, uh, wait, how it's called? Uh, barracks, Lenin's barracks. Basically, okay. this is the group that he joined with, and you can see him uh, on my picture on my Twitter. It's with like it has a round a circle, a red circle around his face. He's really tall. He's like one head taller than everybody else in the group. It's and kind of like uh, how I feel sometimes. they're going. Yo, actually, I'm very tall. Also, how tall are you? Uh, six four. Oh, can you use two inches over Orwell? <laughs> Oh, I can't do Imperial. Can you do metric? Oh. Um, because no? I'm two um, meters. I don't know. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't. Uh, okay, let me see. Okay. Okay. You know how earlier. Two, earlier... two meters to feet um, is 6'5. Uh, six, six, no, 6.5. Six 6.5, six six I guess it is. Uh, wait. Is it? Oh, wait a second. I'm so. Oh, oh, six fifty-six feet, six dot fifty-six. I guess six and a half, something like this. I don't know. And you're oh, one. Dude, I, I, yeah. I, I, I was saying that if you're six um, foot five inches, then I'm one inch shorter than you. Oh, that's dope. It, yeah, there you go. So we are quite tall, both of us, and Orwell as well. And he references his height, and. Uh, by the way, I just remembered a very interesting thing that he mentions in the book constantly. Uh, he is really making fun of Spaniards all the mm -hmm. time. <laughs> Do you remember this? Yes, yes. He was constantly critiquing their culture. Yeah, was he was... Really interesting. He was talking about manana tom tomorrow morning, tomorrow. T tomorrow, Spanish. tomorrow. Yeah. Every problem was tomorrow. Yeah. He's like, how many tomorrows are we going to have? Yeah, and later on, when he was uh, lying to get out of from the police that were trying that were arresting him for uh, affiliating with Poom, he was mm -hmm. lying that um, basically he should get this important letter to um, to the front, and mm -hmm. uh, the person who was like the, the the chief of this particular brigade was listening to him very attentively. He was like a military official. Like he literally told him manana. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> he said, not manana. Very important. <laughs> it's, it <laughs> was so manana. funny. Manana all the time. And also he references how Spaniards can't shoot. Yes. This and also, so he talked about the, their um, very lackadaisical approach to... Um, the whole idea of not only did they not have the adequate weapons necessary for being mm -hmm. on the front, but that the the weapons were old and bad and they didn't even know how to use them. And yeah. the training would take forever. And the officer would just be, um, he wouldn't, he, he was, one of them was very art of adamant about getting everyone ready. And he was very frustrated because everyone would just say, Oh, well, I didn't get this today. I'll get it tomorrow. You know, the yeah. constant. Or else just like, I don't really see this going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, because they they were just marching around the the plants, just like going around, just marching. It was, was like, just... if, we spend, if we spend all this time marching, um, when's our real training coming? Like, we just, we're just marching with yes. sticks, but what about... <laughs> What about rifle training? When are we going to learn to shoot? That these he mentioned that he didn't even shoot. think about it. He like noticed the halfway through that they didn't even see the gun. And he was like, yes. he knew how to shoot, so he was he was okay. But most of the people didn't. And exactly. in the picture, in the picture where you see it was it was done when they were just leaving for Zaragoza, and uh, they were marching around town, and everybody was cheering. They took picture. The, no one has a gun because they didn't have guns. Oh wow! And. Oh, shit. They took the they took the gun when um, basically um, they took it from the people who are in the line, like who are leaving back home. They took their guns and they fought with them, mm -hmm. basically. So it's so funny. And uh, what can you hear me? I, you, I think I can hear you. Out. Oh, that's show. Okay, my internet is so bad. I'm so worried about it constantly. Mm -hmm. So You're actually coming through okay, so don't worry about it. Dope. So what he got as a gun is German Mauser. That was dated 1830, mm -hmm. 1896. So pretty fucking old. And about 40 or 50 years old, yeah. 
Yeah, so like, and it was really bad. It was like the handle was split, and the gun was really terrible. They had no, they had nothing. So if we go to the time we're around chapter three, when mm -hmm. they were discussing stationary warfare, I, I'd like to mention that they had nothing. Like they had the most important things. They they didn't have them. They didn't have candles, like almost no candles, almost no cigarettes, almost no uh, food ammunition, food, and they had no gun oil. And they used um, olive oil to uh, oil the guns. They used bacon grease. Mm -hmm. So they basically got bacon inside and did it. Like It was terrible. And there was one guy who had the, the thing that is used for cleaning the rifle. So like it's, I don't know how it's called in English. And I'm not really sure what I know it's how it's called in Russian. Basically, this thing that you get inside a gun to clean everything out of it. Cleaning the barrel. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, I know the, what you mean. I don't know what it's called. Thing. Yeah. yeah. Basically, it was bent. So every oh, time fuck. the gun was cleaned, cleaned, it scratched the barrel. So the, the, the <laughs> it was terrible. And they were sitting there in the thing, like in the, um, uh, on, in the line. They were sitting there waiting for something to happen, but nothing happened. Hmm. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't have. They didn't have. Um, they just had a long period where they were just out in the desert, just chilling. Um, and and, yeah. and the sad thing what about what they did is they were going around fighting firewood and uh, just sitting around trying not to freeze to death. Yes. Um, the the one thing I was thinking about is that how terrible that is that they had to use uh, food oils, which would have worked, um, which would have worked just fine inside of a gun barrel. The problem with that is that that's useful food. That, that they just had to give to their weapon now. That they just yeah. had to sacrifice this. And that was that would have been valuable as shit out there because they hardly had anything. So that just... That for me just gives you an idea of that they were working with the best that they freaking could and they didn't have a lot. Yeah. And the problem is that they were sitting there. Um, the, the fascist line was really far off. So there is no point in shooting. The fascists right. had machine guns, and so it made no sense to attack. So they just occasionally were going, like, uh, trying to attack them while like, a couple of people were just crawling to the line and trying to take shots. But it was pretty much useless. And he was really upset that he wouldn't wasn't shooting fascists. There was a famous quote of his that is referenced occasionally. First of all, he said that basically. Uh, he only shot two times that he didn't even shoot anyone. So, and oh, he said that um, it takes 1,000 bullets to kill a man. So at this rate, it will take 60 years to for me to kill someone. <laughs> yes. And uh, his main task was uh, to shoot one fascist. He said, I wanted to kill one fascist. And uh, yes, he said that if each one of us would kill one fascist, fascism wouldn't be a problem. Yes. <laughs> so he's like he's saying all those quite radical stuff. If like I'd love to quote it to uh, like some of those Rhine winners when they say, when they use Orwell as the like he literally said it. If if each one of us will kill one fascist, fascism would be a problem. He wasn't even talking mm -hmm. about punching them. He was talking about killing them. Like oh my yeah. god, how do you, um. Yeah, you shouldn't be punching fascists. So who punches fascists? That's so inefficient. You should shoot them. <laughs> exactly. And he's all for that. Well, yeah. Oh, so, it's fucking and he goes on talking about how he, they were on east eastern side of Huasca in Chapter 5. And uh, basically nothing happened. Spring has started. And mm -hmm. so there were lies everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's really terrible. And... Uh, he talks about giant mice, like and ra rats, rats and mice. And like he says that rats were huge. He he, he says that rats were really uh, they were really big as cats or nearly. I remember that. I remember that. Yes. Yeah. And he even says that he pun and he said that lice were not as bad and the weather wasn't as bad compared to rat running around running through your chest when you're sleeping. He said this is the worst feeling in the world. 
And he even says that he punches one of the rats and it flies all across the room. And th this gave him <laughs> some sort of satisfaction. <laughs> well, he, and I at least he got to, yeah. at least he got yeah. to punch. He got to punch a metaphorical fascist. Exactly. <laughs> Basically, he was the style in which he arrives. Especially like if you check out the audiobook on YouTube. Uh, I know that you listen mm -hmm. to it. I listen to uh, to it partly. It's really cool. Uh, it's uh, yes. it's narrated by John Hurt, British actor, and he has very pompous English. And 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 it's really similar to like the feeling of the George Orwell's um, writing gives you. It yes, aligns perfectly. I could, yeah, I could just imagine. I could just like transfix, um, well, not transfix, but I could um, trans uh, plant. John Hurt's voice and Orwell's voice, and I'd be like, "Fucking perfect!" Mm -hmm. it's like I could just imagine that could be it. Because when I was listening to it, I was like, "Man, maybe this was narrated by Orwell." Oh shit, it's John Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty similar to that. It gives this feeling. It's pretty cool. You should check it out. You should yes. just look for it. It's like eight hours long if you haven't read the book, and it's even worth reading if you listen to us talking about it because the style of it and the whole the whole feel of it is just amazing. Um, oh yeah, you could you could just like feel the atmosphere of Catalonia when Orwell yeah. first arrived, and he could see the uh, red and black flags everywhere. That he, you could feel the energy that he felt when he was writing about it. I mean, it was that intense. Exactly. So then he goes on to talk about the people in Catalonia and Aragon, and that he says that he was in the village and he was uh, in the place where they bur buried the dead and it was in the... Oh, I forgot the word in English. I'm so stupid. Wait. Cemetery. I'm sorry. Uh, I occasionally just forget random English words. <laughs> he so was good. in the cemetery. And um, basically he mentions that there is hardly any crosses. There is like hardly any religious symbols. Like occasionally someone mentions heaven in the yeah. inscription on the uh, on the stones on the tombstones but and like he says that there is the whole no lack of religious feeling in orthodox sense mm. and he mentions that the people are racket pure and simple like he says that those people are just like whatever like they well i mean they had for you got to remember there was the huge anti-clerical sentiment in, yeah People didn't like people him. It wasn't time, like yeah. the people no. liked church and the communists didn't. Nobody liked them. Everybody was just sick of that. Nobody oh, really the Catholic didn't church, think about it. The Catholic church yeah. for millennia had been, of course, out of necessity due to having to fight the, the Muslim clerics. Oh, well, not clerics, sorry. But wrong word. Fighting the, the not Muslim millennia. For about 700 years or so? 400 oh, yeah. at least. But I mean... Yeah. They kept the same the type of tight control yeah. that they had during the wartime when the Catholic Church was the um, both the religious and political center of Europe. So um, it yeah. was just like a hand me down. They had to. They just kept the power play because it's what kept them rich. And if you think about yeah. it, the money that came from religion and both being the state. I mean, that's what fuels the Vatican today. Still, is that trend. A magnificent power that they held, that they hold, and held back then. So mm -hmm. obviously, Spanish anarchists are not going to be in favor of religious symbolism, especially not deriving from the Catholics. Yeah, I agree. And actually, talking about Catholic Church, I like to mention some things. Uh, very interesting thing is that in different parts of. Uh, the world, Catholics have different reputation. For example, if we talk about Belarus, my country, uh, we are close to Poland, very, very Catholic place. And uh, because of our political... Oh, can you hear me? Excuse me? Oh, you... Okay. Uh, because of our um, position and our political um, alignment to Poland, we have seen a lot of Catholic influence in the west of my country. And Catholic, Catholics have good reputation overall. Like, they were not... Um, we had a crusade. Like, we won against the crusaders, but those were Germans, and Polish helped us. Helps us. And we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior later on, but on the Orthodox side, basically. But the, the, the west of Belarus is really Catholic still to this day. 
Uh, I personally live right in the center, in the capital, so we have very mixed things. Like we have both both churches, the Eastern Orthodox and Catholics. But yes, if we look at America, America was really fucking critical of Catholic Church in Europe. Really oh, yeah. critical. Oh yeah. This well, America you, for the large part yeah. was mostly Protestant, also. Yeah, exactly. Got to keep that in mind. Do you know the fact that most of the Spanish Inquisition thing was basically a lie? Really? Yeah. Basically, we know that they were burning witches. We know that they did it. But and Spanish uh, Inquisition had a very strong power. There was strong powerhouse. That's also true. But most of the horrors of Spanish Inquisition, like going around the cities in red, burning everyone, like trying to find people that don't eat pork to uh, say that they're Jews and burn them. All of these things were right to an extent, but the horrors of it were mostly created by American Protestants who were painting the Catholic Church as bad as they could. And really? So, so you're talking about large-scale historical revisionism based on a bias? So, yeah, a lot of that. And uh, this is the reputation and why it is so... Mostly not uh, falsification of the facts, because if we look at the facts, we see the reality. Like, there wasn't a huge revisionism in history, but the revisionism right. in, in the culture, in how we look at it, it was mostly influenced by uh, Protestants that were in America that wanted to show that Catholics are really, really bad. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I mean, we see that people in Spain didn't like Catholics. They were yeah. really anti-Catholic. They didn't like them. They're anti-clerical. Uh, but at the same time, in America, Catholics are pretty dope. Like, they have been known to be really, really socialist. Mm. They have been known to create uh, socialist organizations. They were really helping out the community, and they had they have been having really socialist connotations internationally lately. To be honest, like that's really interesting, considering that um, socialism, for a large part, and especially anarchism, is um, inherently um, uh, very against organized religion, or at least organized yeah. religion, not yeah, just yeah. religion. It period. Is. But yeah. But do you know that the head of Jesuit, uh, Jesuit order that was created uh, as anti-Reformation uh, movement, the head of it today is a Marxist? No way. Yeah. If you go, to, if you go to Jesuits, you will see that uh, Jesuit like, uh, leader in the page, you see that the dude has been known to be a communist and a Marxist. And uh, he has been really vocal about it. He is he's open about it. It's pretty interesting that the head of this organization that was created to destroy reformism, mm -hmm. like it, uh, it is he, he's a communist. <laughs> and so, like, it's so interesting to look into the history of those organizations in different times and to see how they have been different, how they have changed, and how they have been changing. So, pretty cool, I think. Okay. I think I think one thing that a lot of people don't know about the Catholic Church and its militancy and why it had such mm -hmm. a strong dominion over the European continent for so long was due to the fact that they had to meet uh, religious and um, statist um, power play on the equivalent or to the equivalent of what the Muslims had during the Middle Ages when they were at war. Mm -hmm. Because that was the one thing that unified the um, Muslim people was that they had that religion. And um, yeah. Europe really didn't have that before the Dark Ages. They just, I mean, they had Christianity, of course, but it was more scattered. So exactly. the Catholic Church arose out of, um, out of need and not necessarily just out of greed. Like all the byproducts yeah. that you saw from the Catholic powers and the abuses that they did... Um, we're largely just a result out of their material conditions, <laughs> if you want to look at it that way. Yeah, pretty much. It's the same thing with uh, many Marxist-Leninists worldwide. It wasn't that those people were crazy, uh, authoritarian, greedy people. Like, right. Especially if you look at, for example, Stalin's time. If you look at the time of purges and the uh, time of forced collectivization and all of that. If you look at the... We have now uh, the KGB... Um, all the KGB stuff, all the records are now open. And we can see uh, that people that back then 
all of those people that were making decisions, they were legitimately communism. Communists. Mm -hmm. They were talking about building socialism. They were talking about uh, actually putting putting the power into the workers' hands. And they have been discussing all of that. And we see that all a lot of terrible stuff that happened during the Soviet times, a lot of mistakes that they did, a lot of terrible, crazy shit that they did, uh, was some of it was really uh, stupid mistakes that led to the deaths of thousands. Yeah. Like... Uh, I'm not saying a lot more, but I'm saying, for example, the Crimean Tatars and moving all of those people uh, like to to the Bashkirkistan on trains while there is a huge famine in Ukraine. So like murdering <laughs> by doing this a lot of people. I'm talking about uh, shooting a bunch of people that were uh, thought of as Polish spies. And uh, all of this is the material conditions in hand doing stuff a lot of time. Like, yeah. all of the, those decisions really are bad and are wrong. But, yeah, this is what they needed after the revolution. To consider the mind and the people at hand um, mm -hmm. discussing the Soviet Union and what they faced, they really did not have a lot of external support. It was a they big didn't. country and they had just come out a few little had um they had literacy problems they had a lot of deficits in their country exactly and when stalin went crazy or when is <laughs> the time when people attribute stalin going crazy i mean a lot of it wasn't mm -hmm. simply that he hated the ukrainians or he hated the russian people but damn those ukrainians made decisions because he was paranoid for a reason and yeah. was, russia was not in a good state I agree. But again, like all of this talk about Stalin, we shouldn't undermine the gains that communism did to the land. Like, I would like to finish this whole uh, going to Russia. We will actually we'll have a very cool thing. Now we will transition to May days. Like, we'll talk about the boom band. So, like, it's like Stalin going crazy, Soviet Union, and we'll like transition. It's very small. It's very cool. I will, <laughs> I will first and foremost tell that there is a quotation, there was a famous saying in Russia. Uh, that says uh, Bolsheviks ravage through the countryside, through every village, uh, through every little town, and left it only with schools, universities, and electricity. Yeah, it's a famous saying that basically tells you what happened. Like the the gains done by the communist party with all the mistakes that they did were amazing it basically created the nations that uh, and managed to um, accommodate for a couple of nations the whole existence for example they created the um, written language for many uh, nations in the far north that were nomadic mm -hmm. people who lived there still they created uh, written language for them. They created written language for Ukrainian and Belarusian, basically creating the nation from the sort of, you know, uh, group with the shared identity that didn't even have, to be honest, identity, especially when we talk about Belarus. 20s basically created all of that because of communism and because of, um, because of the decisions made. Like... Yeah, with all the terrible um, stuff that the West has been doing to the newly born socialist country, they have done a lot of gains. But they've done a lot of mistakes, and this leads us to May days. And um, when the Spanish Republic and the Communist Party of Spain banned Pum and uh, started shooting at all of those people, started shooting at anarchists. So, can you um, give us a little information of what exactly happened when the, like, when um, the the Communist Party tried to seize the telephone exchange? Telephone exchange. I actually would want to ask you that because I haven't gotten really around to that part of it yet. Oh, no, okay, no problem. So basically, the telephone exchange was a very important um, thing, very important piece of uh, infrastructure in terms of communication. Uh, what uh, communists have been doing 
all through the revolution is they had an idea of, oh, war first, revolution second. We should seize all the means of production into the hands of centralized government and get it away from the people, because in this way we can do this most efficiently and like in the best way possible. And uh, they were kind of right. Like uh, they had a good point. If the war, if they lost the war, there would be no even no thought of a revolution. And uh, Communist Party did all of this stuff to protect the revolution. They were backing down on revolution to protect socialism. Like, right. but what it resulted in was basically they were seizing more and more, uh, more and more buildings, more and more uh, factories, uh, and all of those things. They were gathering them all up. And um, people didn't like it that much. They were really in support of anarchists because they gave them power to make decisions. They gave them power to democratically rule over their means of production, uh, the workplace. Yeah. But the communists were persistent. Um, both sides have legitimate points, in my opinion. Like, it is a question that is to be, is always asked, like, okay, how should we deal with the revolution? How should we organize the revolutionary state, revolutionary part, when we are dealing with counter-revolution, when we're dealing with civil war uh, that will almost certainly erupt because mm -hmm. like reactionary forces are just waiting for us to start something. And uh, this is what happened in Spain. Basically, the turning point was on 3rd of May. Uh, like, the Barcelona was the only, um, Spain was the only country in the world in 1937 that hadn't had May Day celebrations. Every country had a parade, oh, wow. they didn't. Because they oh, wow. were... So, excuse me? Oh, I was just saying, oh, wow, that's interesting. I did not yeah. know that. Basically, it was, it was due to the fact that they, the air was really almost on fire. Like, they were so... Uh, they were basically waiting for one of the sides to start shooting. Like, yeah. they wanted to start something, they wanted to have a parade, but they didn't. And uh, Barcelona basically erupted into a conflict between the Spanish government, uh, Communist Party, and the CNT and Pum on the 3rd of May. What basically happened is that um, for the longest time, uh, the internet, the brigades, the um, uh, militia forces that were the main fighting force of the anarchists and the Pum, um, were slandered, and they were said like basically, oh, those stupid uh, failing, failing brigades, they can't de do anything. And by the way, the Trotskyists, oh, they made, there is a Trotskyist plot and whatnot. Basically, what Trotskyist plot meant, Trotskyist party meant at the time, it meant not that the party belongs to Fourth International, but they were literally fascists in disguise that were saying that they're socialists. So this is the word that has been used. And um, Pum was named a Trotskyist organization, not in the meaning belonging to Leon Trotsky, but first and foremost that they are secret fascists, and they were banned. And uh, every single person who was fighting in the ranks of Pum, even before this thing were guilty of being fascists, George Orwell included. And uh, oh, wow. basically, the fighting has started. They were building the barricades. They were um, started shooting at each other. He, um, Orwell says that they were sitting in the building and there was... Um, people from the Popular Front, so the government army, they were on the opposite side, and they in the cafe on the first floor, they were on the rooftop with guns, waiting for shots. And uh, what happened is that th those people were shouting, oh, we're working class, don't shoot at us, we are friends. And they were like, yeah. then come over, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and so oh, shit. it was it was really terrible and people were shooting at each other constantly and uh, everybody did nobody wanted to that's the problem like oh wow nobody wanted to fight but they still did and they were shooting and they were killing each other and uh, the event is called maydays and uh, the casualties are 
the, the, in Barcelona, around 500 or 1,000 uh, people died and uh, 1,500 wounded. Basically, uh, it's really hard to say how many people because as uh, um, Orwell says himself that the numbers are varied because there are a lot of biased sources. On one side, you have communists and on an anarchist, and everybody's saying their own number. So it's really crazy. Uh, many people say that this is a very important time in the ideolo ideological shifts in, in Orwell's mind. This is the time when he lost all, um, all respect for the Communist Party. Yeah. Like, he was, he was really frustrated with it. He was really angry. And uh, you see the shift in his politics after that. Like, uh, as he says himself that he came there as just a person who wanted to find fascism, he came there as a, uh, as a democratic socialist and uh, anti-Stalinist. Right. It's, it's really a fucked up event, to be honest. Like... <sighs> I, uh, I, uh, my, in my opinion, this is just stupid. Like, this is the sectarian debate <laughs> gone gone very wrong. Yeah, they started yeah, yeah. killing each other. <clears throat> What's your thoughts on the whole May Days thing? Um, I would say, given the time, and given the fact that they, they were so scattered, I guess you'd say, and mm -hmm. sectarianism has always been a problem within the left. I mean, you can still see it today. People talk about left unity and it's like, ha <laughs> yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. And plus, you, since you have a lot of history between the opposing sects, um, say like with the, um, the anarchists and the communists, there's always going to be that history there. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be preventing people from talking in the first place. Uh, and those who do try will get caught mm -hmm. in the crossfire and eventually they're just going to have to secede or concede to the fact that um, maybe that's not necessarily the way to go about it and we should stick to our camps and try to um, but um, I also think that because of the time the fact that they were so small and the fact mm -hmm. that they were so outnumbered and the fact that of course it was decentralized that of course that was probably inevitable and it's they're lucky that it didn't happen more often. I agree. Yeah, some other thoughts about the events. Uh, what we know that the people who were seizing the government, uh, the government assault guards, who called this group that seized the telephone exchange, uh, they were armed, and all of this popular front, they were armed with Mosin's, the Soviet rifles, and. Uh, so we see that first and foremost, it was planned in advance that the poon will be banned and uh, all of this stuff will be con seized by the Communist Party and uh, to basically prevent revolution. And uh, we see that the guns that, the, um, for example, Orwell had, he, he says about uh, it in this way, all of them were armed with brand new rifles vastly better than the dreadful old blunderbusses we had at the front. So it yeah. was really crazy. And this is why it was so successful. One, one of the sides were really, really prepared. Mm. Yeah. That is true. That is true. And, and, he wasn't, and he wasn't, before that, he wasn't really aware of all the politics. Like, if you read the whole thing, there was an amazing quote when he was in the Zaragoza front. He was sitting there. And there were, was another group of the, on their side just moving somewhere. And one of his uh, comrades said, oh, look, there are socialists. And he was like, wait a second. Aren't we all socialists? Yeah, <laughs> I, remember like, I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. And it's a very cool attitude. He was like, fuck it. We're all socialists. Let's go and kill the fascists. Fashy, fashy, bashy, bashy, whatever. I don't care. And, and he says that the politics played a huge role in the conflict, inner politics. He said that the government was getting reshuffled all the time, each time moving to the right. Uh, and uh, at the time after the, uh, the May days, he said that the new, next government will be full on right wing, meaning the Communist Party. 
the, the revolution is pretty much over. And you see when he then he re-enlists because Poom was banned. He basically uh, hit his Poom card. Uh, um, um, he wasn't part of the Ponty, if I recall correctly, but he had the papers uh, as being a member of the fighting force. And he hit these papers and he re-enlisted in the... Um, Wait, what was the called the international column so that he could go to Madrid, Madrid from front. Basically, he it's really crazy, and his career as the fighter um, finished really quickly after that. Uh, basically, what happened is that his friend uh, Cop uh, K O P P he uh, wanted to free him from the prison and uh, he lied to the um, prison guards that he had very important letter to deliver to the front and uh, the, the person who was an important military official at the time literally told him okay manana <laughs> while the oral was lying to him saying about a very important thing that should be delivered to the front that cop was arrested by mistake and um, he was refused like yeah then he he says that cop uh, most certainly died in secret prison for being a trotskist oh. oh. basically so everything finished on pretty dark and um, his whole thing finished with him getting an, an injury he got shot in the neck with his vocal cord, uh, one of the vocal cords being paralyzed, but bullet not touching his uh, arteries and any vital parts. And uh, he explains, he goes into a lot of detail of how, uh, what does it feel to get shot. Yeah. Um, I think I can find it. Um, hey, I'm because... still... I'm still here. Just keep talking. I'm yeah? just getting some of the drink. Oh, oh dope. You have a drink. I will. I will try to find. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is this is the part where he um, where he says, "How does it feel to get shot?" Uh, I will quote it from the text. Roughly speaking, it was the sensation of being at the center of an explosion. There seemed to be a loud bang and the blinding flash of light all around me. And I felt a tremendous shock. No pain, only a violent shock. Such as you get from an electric terminal. Um, with it, a sense of utter weakness, of being stricken and shivering up to nothing. The sandbags in front of me receded into uh, immense distance. I fancy it would feel much the same if you were struck by lightning. I knew immediately that I was hit, but because uh, of the seeming bang and flash, I thought it was a rifle nearby that had gone off accidentally and shot me. All this happened in spare time, in spare of time, much less than a second. Next moment, my knees crumbled up and I was falling. My head hit the, uh, the ground with a violent bang, which, to my relief, did not hurt. I had a numb, dazed feeling and a, con and a consciousness of being very badly hurt, but no pain in the ordinary sense. Basically, um, he was, he was, he, f he thought that he's dead, basically. He thought that's it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, there is another quote by his. Uh, as soon as I knew that the bullet had gone clean through my neck, I thought uh, for granted that I was done for. I had never heard of a man or an animal getting a bullet through the middle of the neck and surviving it. The blood was dribbling out of the corner of my mouth. The artery's gone, I thought. I wondered how long you last when, you, uh, when your uh, carotid artery is cut. Not many minutes, presumably. Everything was blurry. There must have been about two minutes during which I assumed I was killed. And that, too, was interesting. I mean, uh, I mean, it is interesting uh, to know what your thoughts would be at such a, at such a time. My first thoughts, um, conventionally enough, was for my wife. Uh, my second was a violent uh, resentment at having to leave this world, which, when all is said and done, 
uh, suits me so well. <laughs> uh, I had oh, wow. to, it's very how he puts it. I just fucking love it. I had time to feel this very vividly. The stupid mis uh, the stupid um, mishands uh, in um, infuriated me. The meaningless of it to be bombed off. Uh, not even in battle, but in this stale corner uh, of the trenches, thanks to a moment's carelessness. Basically, they were sitting in a trench, and uh, the sun was uh, setting right behind their backs, and he just lifted up his head too much. And so the sniper saw it, and he shot. Oh, wow. And because, like, you see against the sun, you see the head pretty clearly, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, he took a shot, and he got him through the neck. Uh, I thought too of the man who had shot me, wondered what he was like, whether he was a Spaniard or foreigner, whether he knew he had got me, and so forth. I could not feel any resentment against him. I reflected that as he was a fascist, I would have killed him if I could, but that, but that if he had been taken prisoner and brought before me at this moment, I would merely have congratulated him on, the good, on his good shooting. <laughs> it may be though that if you were uh, really dying, your thoughts would be quite different. So yeah, he basically his injury was pretty weird. He got his one of his hands were paralyzed. His voice was gone, and uh, for no reason, by the way, he didn't know why his right hand was paralyzed. He said it's pretty weird, and uh, he was sent to the um, uh, hospital. He describes hospital as a very weird place because. Uh, there were not a lot of experienced nurses because he assumes that most of the nurses before the war were nuns. And uh, he, one of the nurses tried to force feed him uh, the egg, uh, the, the egg and the soup while his neck, while he had a bullet through his neck. <laughs> and she was really shocked by the fact, he was really shocked by, she was shocked by the fact that he refused to eat. And uh, mm. he said that um, the, they sent everyone to Barcelona, and the the train was always manana. So no, he was really waiting for, to be sent back to Barcelona, and uh, he told his wife that he was coming to Barcelona when he finally was coming there. Basically, uh, I don't, I think we men failed to mention that halfway through the book, his wife comes to Barcelona and waits for him, and when he's on the leave, he wanted to meet her. But the May Days happened when he was on the leaf. Basically, this is the biggest frustration of his life. He was shouting. He was really sad by the fact that the only time he got off the off the front, he was fighting communists in in Barcelona. <laughs> and so, oh, wow. uh, basically, then he goes to he goes to the other place. Uh, he wasn't sent to Barcelona. He, he they changed the place. He got into much trouble with being the pool member. He tried to save cop. He fails. And uh, by the time when he came back, uh, oh, you, you, oh shit, we fucked up. Uh, during the main days, uh, the pool wasn't banned. This is the crazy part. It wasn't banned. It's just the fighting were going on. By the time he was injured and came. Uh, during the time when he was in the hospital, this is the time when they officially banned Poom, and he was basically a persona non grata anywhere. And uh, he right. managed to get to Barcelona. Um, he managed to find his wife. He destroyed his Poom papers, and uh, later on, after hiding from the government, he and his wife were on on the way back home. Yeah, and uh, he had no problem getting the papers uh, and um, going on a train. And uh, they went to France. And the first thing he did, he had a cup of tea, and he bought a lot of cigarettes. Yeah, and cigars. He said, "This is weird feeling that like he got from this whole thing." And uh, he said the first thing he did is buy some cigarettes and t have a cup of tea. And uh, he also said that he met with a lot of people in France. A lot of them were supporters of anarchists. A lot of them were supporters of fascists. 
And uh, he talked to some people who were ba- going home back from Spain also, and all they could talk to co- talk about was Spain. And he, the only feeling he was really re- he wanted to come back. This is so weird. He was really saying that he, I was so tired from it. I was tired from war, but I wanted to go back desperately. And uh, oh wow, he yeah he gets home. And uh, the ending of the book is just superb. I wanted to quote it directly. The last paragraph of the book, it is amazing. So uh, he spends the time going through um, through the through France. He comments on the fact that uh, the fascist, if the fascists come to power, uh, because at the time he was writing, it was still unresolved. If fascists, if Franco comes to power in Spain, he says that it won't be as bad as in. Uh, Italy or Germany, but it would be still bad. And uh, he said that he would take the Communist Party anytime, any day. Like, but he was really worried about the war. And then he says the following: This is the last paragraph of the book. Uh, and then England, Southern England, probably the sleekest landscape in the world. It is difficult when you pass that way, especially when you're peacefully recovering from seasickness with the plush cushions of a boat train carriage under your bum, to believe that anything is really happening anywhere. Earthquakes in Japan, famines in China, revolutions in Mexico. Don't worry, the milk will be on the doorstep tomorrow morning. The new statesman will come out on Friday. The industrial towns were far away, the smudge of smoke and misery hidden by the curve of the Earth's surface. Down here was still the England I had known in my childhood. The railway cuttings smothered in the wildflowers, the deep meadows where the great um, shining horses browse and uh, meditate, the slow-moving streams um, borged by willows, the green bosoms of the elms, the uh, the larkspurs in the cottage gardens, and then the huge, peaceful wilderness of outer London, the barges of the Mary River, the familiar streets, the posters telling of cricket marches and royal weddings, the men in bowler hats, the pigeons in Trafalgar Square, the red buses, the blue policemen, all sleeping in deep, deep sleep of England, from which I sometimes fear that we shall never wake till we are jerked out of it by the roar of bombs. It is so beautiful. I just, I just wanted to quote it directly. Like, and he's not that saying about awesome. the war. And he wasn't just saying about like, oh, bombs, like, like for example, German bombs. He was saying about the grenades, the Molotov cocktails, and stuff like this. He was saying that yes, nobody will see the revolution coming. Right. And. I think this feeling refers to the feeling a lot of people that live in the first world have, and uh, in, in the in the parts of the world where the people benefit from imperialism, like this is the feeling you get. You're like in deep sleep. Nothing is happening. Everything is chill. Like everything is good, and n- nothing nothing worries you. Like there is some stuff that is happening, but you're like you're okay. You're like whatever. Well, like some parts of the world are just fucked up, you know, fucked up by poverty, fucked up by imperialism, fucked up by natural disasters and whatnot, like, everything is just crazy, but yeah, we're chilling, whatever. You know? But yeah. I think we're sort of coming to an end of it in terms of uh, in terms of, not the stream, <laughs> in terms of the uh, epoch. Like, it feels that the world I is starting so. to close in on itself. Like, capitalism is now officially global. Uh, Communism didn't stop it. And uh, now we see that the Europe is getting, in Europe and America, all the first world countries are getting shaken by international terrorism, by the rise of the left, rise of the fascists. We see that, like, something is brewing up and it may erupt into into something big. I, I have no idea if it will. Something crazy is certainly around the corner. Um, in the yeah. book, he goes into great length discussing the um, discussing the situation at the time, mm-hmm. the international politics that were um, 
playing a big hand into what was going on in Spain and like yeah. Russia's Russia's um he almost portrayed it to be that Russia was in collusion with Franco a- at least in resistance to the um uh, CNTF AI yeah um, I, I- I agree. We were talking that they were trying to prevent the revolution. This is why he mentions that. that they were basically helping the fascist side, and he was so frustrated with it. Yes, because yeah. it would have made no sense for them to do that. And yet they mm-hmm. did. But I see a lot of people nowadays, a lot of Marxist Leninists are saying, yeah, that's right, this is what you should do. And they agree with this policy. They say, yeah, war first, revolution second. Why would you do a revolution if you die? And right. uh, I see some legitimate points, but based on the actions, like if we look at the, in theory, that's good. But if we look mm-hmm. at the actions of the, of the communists in Spain, I can't get behind that. Like I can't, this is well, just I mean, stupid. They, they portray it as being a matter of impracticality. Yeah. Would, would you see it as <clears throat> less of an excuse? more of an excuse on the Russians' part because it meant that they wouldn't face a threat from the anarchists? Well, that's the point. On one side, it is impractical to have a decentralized economy and military while you're in the middle of a civil war. But again, we, we should understand that uh, the policy of socialism in one country doesn't mean, oh, we won't have socialism anywhere else. It meant okay, we are in charge, we should use the socialism in benefit of us. Like, we are using international struggle to benefit us. And we see that this policy has been uh, very big uh, through the 20th century, like uh, the socialism, like, for example, Eastern Bloc countries, they basically were in such an economic disarray in the 90s due to the fact that the communist government in in Moscow dictated the economy to be built up in accordance to the needs of the Soviet Union, not in accordance of self-sustainability of the socialist republics. Like, yeah. basically, they were producing one or two commodities, and that's it. Why, why would you do any, anything else? Like, you, you're fed, and you produce stuff for us. Yeah, socialist, uh, to quote the great uh, chairman of the YouTube international, Jason Unruh, socialist surplus extraction value. Mm-hmm. Exactly, <laughs> socialist surplus extraction. This is this is what they have been doing, and there was a possibility that they would do the same thing in Spain, and they would turn Spain into the puppet uh, of the Soviet interests, not into a socialist country. In my right. opinion, it doesn't mean that we should uh, get behind Marxist-Leninist uh, ideas of the revolution. For me personally, it is a call to action to. Uh, non-Marxist-Leninist communists to think about the ways of organizing those things as industry and military at times of war, um, mm-hmm. but in an efficient way. Like I don't think the the way you yeah. uh, the way you describe Russia and their plans on uh, controlling. Um, Spain at that time almost makes Russia sound imperialist. Well, some people call Soviet uh, so- Soviet imperialist, but I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I would say well, that I mean, it was it was yeah, it was simply the way that you the way that you said it. Uh, I think it, it uh-huh. had a lot of um, it had a lot of um, just the way that you said it made it to where you could you could view it as that's almost in line with how the imperialists operate you know you have a, you have a little country that you can uh pick around and <clears throat> take their um and take their um their resources and what they produce and basically use it for your own good and suppress well, yeah their... it's sort of that but again uh and and suppress the resistance but look at soviet union and look at the second half of the 20th century this is mm-hmm. what happened yeah. There were insurrections against Soviet Union. They were suppressed. There were people who were speaking out against the uh, Soviet Union government in support of uh, worker self-management. They were suppressed. And uh, Trotskyism, be- Trotskyist became a swear word. 
in Russia. Right. So, like, any critique was smothered and destroyed. And I don't personally put the blame on uh, Khrushchev and Khrushchev's government, as many Marxist Leninists do. I put oh, wow. the blame on Stalin because we see that the same thing has been happening at this time. They were doing it. Like, this is just a logical conclusion of socialism in one country policy. Ah. Like, this is what it is about, in my opinion. Like, that's why I'm a filthy trot. <laughs> well, I can't say that I'm a trot, trot, but I see that Trotsky was really correct in his critique, and I believe that his ideology is the closest I can subscribe to. Oh, that's very interesting. It's very interesting yeah. take on that. Now, by the way, I haven't mentioned, what is your, uh, what is your ideology? Are you uh, an egoist <laughs> based on your avatar? <laughs> um, egoism, I dabble in egoism, yes. Egoism, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So, yeah, you pretty much see that all of this shit is just a bunch of spooks. It's just silly to... Just For, silly well, I would say that there's... I would say that there's a practicality that could be taken into account when you talk about the economic models. Yeah. Because um, Sterner never really touched upon... Um, economics his was more of along the line of a scientific understanding for the individual stands versus the collective in yeah. terms of um, <clears throat> just because uh, these people are under the delusion that they are all the same because of their ideology it doesn't mean that they are mm -hmm. um, so as far as a worldview goes in terms of classifying yourself according to groups or group yeah. characteristics I would say that I don't necessarily subscribe to that notion Mm -hmm. uh, that but I see that if you're like uh, while uh, egoism, egoism, and uh, is not a legitimate uh, political theory, it is a philosophical critique that could be really helpful. Like I enjoy Sterner's uh, outlook on uh, on dogmas and on social dogmas that we have. I when yeah. I got uh, when I understood and when I understood what he was talking about in ego on his own, I see that uh, I started to see the stupid shit around at me and uh, like legitimately illegitimate ideas that people have and that I may have. Yeah, like it's it's really helpful to get rid of just Un dogmas. unscientific thinking. Yes, scientific thinking. Right. Yeah. And uh, that is uh, essentially I use Sterner for Sterner for a um, sorry to cut you off a, a, a mm -hmm. psychological worldview and how yeah. I stand in relation to the world, at least in terms mm -hmm. of who I am. Um, but in economics, um, when it comes to economics, I would say that I, I wouldn't subscribe to sacred socialism, as he would put it, but more or less to mm -hmm. the more practical understanding of socialism which would give the egoist more freedom <clears throat> right because in a capitalist society you're a slave to money and this takes your ego and requires your ego to sublimate your wishes according to what you have to do to survive in said society okay so i get it yeah. This is what I subscribe to. I agree completely that the aim of socialism, one of the aims of socialism at least, is the lab, uh, the realization of spirit, of ego, of anything inside, the freedom, in, in more freedom. Like, this is what Hegel's idea of spirit is. Like, the, the, the time is... Uh, the, the history is... The history of the world is the history of spirit realizing itself through freedom. Each... Uh, system before us was less free and more we move into the future the more free the individual is so yeah uh, that one of the aims of socialism is to do the next step in terms of liberation the human yes. liberation basically it it's funny how they um how the, like the right wing looks at socialist concepts of freedom and they're like that's not freedom but it's like well from where do you get your i where do you get your notions that your side is any more free i mean if anything uh, it's just liberals. more dogmatic <laughs> they are quite dogmatic this is the problem the like dogmatism on any side is really dangerous and uh, let us move to the last point of our discussion if you may the orwell's list ah, i think yes we should we should talk about this thing because 
for many people, this is where, like, this is the thing that is mentioned every time you mention George Orwell in a positive, in a positive sense in the leftist community. Uh -huh. Like, he is praised by the right wing and hated by most of the leftists while being yes. a democratic socialist. I will, I will say this. <laughs> um, the first time I discovered the list, I was, um, I was enraged. I was right. completely, I was like, Orwell, man, I've felt like I've known you my whole life. How could you do this? You know, it was, um, yeah. and of course I didn't understand the context. I just discovered that oh, he gave this information to the authorities and it completely bamboozled me because he was um, one of the main <laughs> figures that I respected among the left, uh, particularly just because of the fact yeah. that he was from one of the major imperialist countries of the 20th century. And the centuries right. before that as well. But, um, <clears throat> and it was like, for all of his talk, he then just turns around and does a 180 and just sells out his comrades. Like how, that'd be like saying your whole life you're against sense. murder and yeah. then, and then you, you blow someone. up a school and you die. And that's like your final act. Okay. Um, I was like, does that not I nullify? Agree. It just doesn't make sense, right? It's just yeah. like, why? Yes. And so then I start looking into it. What were the possible reasons behind this act? Well, for one thing, um, I don't, I think you, you told me about this. I think it was um, yesterday or the day before that um, talking about how he took meticul he meticulously made notes of people. He, he kept track of people kind of like how the Romans were very meticulous about keeping track of dates and times and uh, occurrences that went down. He was, he was very um, into keeping track of people, right? He would mm -hmm. like, um, even as a, as an officer, he would uh, keep meticulous note of the people he knew. So with that in mind, also there's, there's the people who say, well, he was dying of tuberculosis and this has the potential um, effect of changing who you are as a person. It, right. it starts messing with your mind when you start deteriorating. Um, you start to lose it. And it's very possible that some people say that Orwell simply went mad. And it's just a possibility, he, yeah. Yeah, and that he gave this information probably um, out of some, partly some leftover fear of the Soviet powers encroaching on England and he really did not like the Soviets because of his experiences. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, instead of just getting angry and saying, Orwell sucks, how could he do this? I didn't take mm -hmm. the pragmatic approach and try to understand what were, what was the context? What was the context that, um, of the situation? What caused him to do that? So, I mean, do you know any aspects of it that probably most people don't know? Oh, it's really, in my opinion, like overall, it's really creepy because uh, you see this person who has dedicated his literally life to socialism and crit critiquing the imperialism and uh, critiquing totalitarianism. And you're like, okay, dude, let's see what you're up to. And then like he does this, he does this com completely logical thing. Like um, what he wrote is just atrocious. I, I'd love first and foremost to mention some of the things he wrote about particular people. Yeah. Because not only he gave <clears throat> a list of so-called cryptos of fellow travelers, but he also wrote a bunch of reactionary shit, which um, exposed him as a very bigoted person. Which yeah, which is not it's like very surprising. Yeah, like I would like to say what he wrote uh, about. For example, Stephen Spencer, sentimental sympathizer tendency towards homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Like, what the fuck? George, you're what? fucking crazy. Then Richard Crossman, too dishonest to be an outright fellow traveler. Uh, King, uh, Kinsley Martin, well, uh, I'm sorry, I want to say something. Uh, yes, uh, in reference to um, homosexuality in, in England at that time, we have to remember that homosexuality was illegal. illegal. Yeah. So him listing that, um, 
he was probably trying to consider the fact that this person might be arrested if they couldn't get anything on him. They could arrest him on that alone. So, you know. Yeah. Keep on, keep going. Okay, so uh, Kingsley Martin. Uh, I'm not saying everything, by the way. I'm just mentioning some of the most atrocious shit. Uh, Kingsley yeah. Martin, uh, decade liberal, very dishonest. Uh, and Paul, th those are like comments he wrote. Uh, to He's making character things. judgments. Yeah. And Paul Robinson, who was uh, an American um, jazz musician. Wait, let me check yeah. whether I'm correct. Yeah, he's, he's a civil rights movement. Uh, he was involved with civil rights movement, and he's a bass, uh, bass singer and actor. Yeah, he was, he was a singer and an actor. He says the following. Very anti-white Henry Wallace supporter. Hmm. Like, my fucking God, anti-white. <laughs> like, why would you, how can you expect anti-white as a phrase for a leftist? That is very reactionary rhetoric to be coming from someone like George Orwell. Which exactly. does, does make it, um, it does make it, um, make his state of mind suspect. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Because maybe either he wrote yeah. this later on and before and then took those names and then wrote them down while he was sick, adding on these things that he remembered about them. Um, it, was done, it, was young, it was done when he was getting treatment from tuberculosis and this guy from uh, Information Research Department came and uh, asked him. Like, basically, you should understand, it wasn't that he outed some, uh, like, uh, crypto-communists. It wasn't the case. The whole purpose of this list was it was given to Information Research Department as a list of people that he deemed uh, not suited to create anti-Soviet propaganda due to his assumption that they could be in support of Soviet Union. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Like, yes. this is a correction that I should make. He didn't out a bunch of comrades. He mentioned those people as unsuited to be part of anti-propaganda smearing of Soviet Union, like, which is bad enough, in my opinion, but it's, it's shocking to get it from Orwell. And uh, the right wing yeah. just leached onto that, I should mention. Like, all of the newspapers were just filled with, oh, look, uh, leftist poster boy Orwell outed a bunch of communists. And it was, like, really clickbaity all around. People were, like... Um, Socialist icon who became an informer. This is the line in 1988. Daily Telegraph broke the story. Like, mm -hmm. oh my fucking god! Socialist icon who became an informer. Mm -hmm. Like Not the only time that they'll admit he was socialist too. <laughs> yeah, they just forgot about this. Just they oh whatever, and uh, it's so stupid. And by the way, um, conservatives loved it, but I should mention that. Uh, information research department was a department in Labour Party when Labour Party was in charge, and Labour Party was really fucking reactionary at the time. It still is partly, and uh, like, it's really, really crazy. But in my opinion, it shouldn't dismiss all of his work. Uh, I think that uh, he really wanted to help uh, this uh, Labour government because they were still left wing, but they were pushed to the right because of the fear of Soviet Union. And right. we are saying, we are talking about the time when everybody was really fucking afraid of Stalinism. And uh, yeah. yes, it's a thing. It's, it's a thing. Stop saying it's not a thing. Uh, and um, to quote Bernard Crick, uh, he did it because he thought the Communist Party was a total total I'm sorry, totalitarian menace. Uh, he wasn't denouncing these people up as uh, subvers subversives. He was denouncing them as unsuitable for counterintelligence operation. Oh, so, that gives a much better context. Exactly. So, like, uh, also another quote uh, by historian John uh, Newsinger. A terrible mistake on his part, delivering in equal measure from his hostility to Stalinism and his illusions in the Labour government. What it certainly does not amount to, however, is an um, abandonment of the socialist cause or transformation into a foot soldier in the Cold War. Indeed, Orwell made clear on a number of occasions that his opposition to any uh, British McCarthyism 
to any bans and uh, prescriptions on Communist Party members. They certainly did not reciprocate this. Uh, and any notion of a pre pre uh, preventive, uh, of, uh, of a preventive war. He had lived long enough to realize that the IRD, the organization he gave the names to, was actually about. Uh, there can be no doubt that he would have broken with it. So, like, he, maybe he the, what people are appealing to. A, he didn't. He had no idea what he was doing. Like he understood that what he is doing, but he didn't know what he is giving the, the, those names to, because he was vocally anti-McCarthyist. But this uh, IRD thing was really McCarthyist. Yeah, and, it was. Uh, yeah. So like, it's really fucked up. Like, uh, oh, someone is saying that uh, Chad is saying George Orwell was a narco Nazbol. Yeah, pretty much. Marco Nesbol. Like, he was an anarchist who was giving out names to the government. <laughs> he was out in the communists. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I'm asked about religious socialism in uh, and religious socialism in my country. In my country, there is no religious socialism. To be honest, socialism is pretty much dead here. We have really interesting stuff on the right, to be honest reactionary dudes are pretty interesting. I think I will talk about them in the podcast. I will hopefully upload it tomorrow. There are some news I would love to talk about. And religious socialism, like, what's your opinion? I think it's just good, but I don't think, like, socialism is contradictory to religion itself. It contradicts to the religious religion being used as a power structure, right? Um, I would say in... If you were to say that socialism had an essence, I would mm -hmm. say that it was probably more. It, it religion material. would have a yeah. Right. It's it's, it's, like, it's, it's material. So this. yeah, but I wouldn't say that um, on an individual basis that people would should have to give it up. I would just say yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. It should be more of the personal thing, and don't try to push it into politics. I would say that probably the organized religions wouldn't be um they wouldn't have as much power i don't think in a socialist system yeah um because they don't give money to them this is like a crazy part many people say that soviet union destroyed churches and shit uh in many cases and killed like uh priests they killed priests in spain in russia in many ways uh they blew up churches for the reasons that the churches became abandoned because they couldn't sustain themselves without government funds. Like, church uh -huh. has been always used as the power uh, that helped to legitimize the government, and then came the Soviets, who mm -hmm. said, fuck you, we will better build culture centers everywhere, and, like, teach people how to read and shit. <laughs> and then, like, religion sort of became obsolete in such a system because, like, oh, fuck, nobody's given us money. We don't have much resources. People are now doing other stuff. Shit, we better close the church up. And they basically repurposed churches into, like, different uh, interculture centers, into cinemas. For example, uh, a red cathedral in Minsk, a very beautiful building made out of red brick, was made. Uh, they made uh, during the war. It was um, like a storage, and after the war, they made it. Uh, they made a cinema out of it because it was mm -hmm. like a big, big place. Why don't we turn it into a cinema? So it's pretty interesting. Uh, I don't think social, like religion, contradicts socialism. Yeah, I pretty much agree with you, Max. That like it's just. It it won't get have such huge power, like it would still exist, but nobody would care about it most mostly. Well, I think yeah. I think most I think um, uh, people who try to completely get rid of religion entirely. Um, I mean, I mean, I think you should have a secular state just because you want fairness in treatment of all mm -hmm. peoples as possible. But as far as on the individual basis i mean you're it's just a part of humanity that will probably never go away uh people yeah. are going to stick to their spooks out of culture out of personal need um i kind of apply the live and let live but i also would say that 
in cases of like you say like Islamic extremism, obviously this is going to be a case in which, um, or even Christian extremism, whatever whatever particular religion tries to enforce um, uh, archaic barbaric rules upon a large swath of the population. I mean, I'd say that that's a threat to any type of democratic society just because of yeah. the fact that it's rooted in dogma and um, religious extremism and not in a rational um, account of the situation. So Rational. I'm sorry. I get triggered from the word rational. <laughs> oh, sorry, sir. <sorry>. Um, <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm not, a, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the armored skeptic or whatever. Don't worry about it. Uh, he's actually one of the good ones. He's like he's not that bad. He like still spews stuff, but he's actually one of those guys who's not going out and supports uh, like proto-fascist people and like like Sargon. No, he's not bad. I was just using him as an example of yeah, irrational yeah, yeah, yeah. because he is one. Um, yeah, yeah, but, but I don't I, understand I know, what I you're coming from. I don't understand what you're coming from with the with this, and yeah. I believe that. I think to like get it back into Spain and finish it all off, um, sooner or later, even if, for example, such things as extre- like as uh, mentioned before, uh, religious extremist governments, like mm-hmm. it all comes to the point when they cannot provide the thing they promised. Like it all comes to the point when everybody gets sick from it. And we have the situation like in Spain. Yeah. Like there is a lot of it. It still has power, but nobody fucking cares about it. Like, like whatever. They still a lot of them are still are still religious, but they are still don't care or outright hate. They start rounding them up against the wall and shooting them. Like mm. this is how it usually yeah. ends. This is how it ends with all power. Yeah. Like to 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 like you know to talk <laughs> with bringing into intersectionality and Foucault. Sooner or later, your fucking power structures will fail, and you're getting shot. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And uh, I think Spain well, I mean, is a great t- example of those you know all systems failing. Well, if you want to talk about um, power and what happens when it gets like into the hand of a mob, just look at. Um, you know the the first revolution against the um, the monarchs, the feudal system in uh, France, the French Revolution. Oh yes, yes. Um, Look at what happened revolution. when the mob ran out of monarchs to be head. They went after their Pretty own. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They just went and cut heads because this is what happens. Because the more you press on the people, the sharper the edge of the guillotine becomes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like this is just this is just how dialectics works. Yeah, and also dialectics you, work. Yeah. This, that also happened as a result of not understanding dialectics very well, because yeah. someone who has an unrealistic worldview um, mm-hmm. is going to dehumanize and um, hate the other side. They're not going to understand material conditions. They're not going to understand what's mm-hmm. the why behind what's going on. Is where dialectics is important, and where a lot of people. Um, don't put a lot of effort into viewing it that way. It's kind of like understanding the situation just before you react. Like why, Mm -hmm. like why are police officers so um, violent towards say, for instance, some oppressed group or whatever? Mm -hmm. Well, what are the, what happens with these two groups? Uh, What's going on with them? Um, Is one group um, constantly in fear of the other one? Um, and does this create hostility between the two? Um, is there a, pi- a power dynamic that's not being addressed? Is there a cultural dynamic that's not being addressed? Um, right. One aspect of it is like it's it's falling into unscientific thinking when you just label one group as a monolith. It's very spooky to just see um, one group and just assume that all members are a certain way. It's very mm-hmm. fallacious thinking, but it's all too common nowadays. I, agree. I think material conditions are very important to consider when looking at a situation instead of just like jumping to um, just jumping to a conclusion like liberals do. It's very un it's very unpragmatic and it's unrealistic and it's damaging because it leaves the cause of the problem unsolved, unaddressed, and you're simply um, going about 
and band-aiding <laughs> you're applying band-aids to things yeah. and it's it's like taking a someone who's got this huge head wound and instead of sewing it up you're just you're just uh giving it a little band-aid on the bit and so there you go there you go you're all right now but also you're not helping that person not get the head injury mm -hmm. in the same way he did last time you're not addressing why there was a head why injury. it happened yeah 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 I, yeah i feel you it's actually like it reminds me of how i used to look at things before I became who I am now. Uh, first, I started off my political journey while being on the right libertarian sort of, you know, not outright Iron Rand shit, but right libertarian, like, yeah, government sucks, we should have private property, mostly coming from my reaction from experience in the life in a post-Soviet country that is basically where state plays such a huge power politically and economically. And I'm like, uh -huh. no, state sucks. We should, we should get more private property everywhere and everything will be chill, small and medium businesses forever. And, uh, I and understand I looked, where that yeah. was. Yeah. And when I looked at like social issues, I was like, yeah, I guess there are some differences between people. Yeah. There are like explosions like 9-11, for example. Yeah. Muslims are crazy, terrible motherfuckers. Everybody, we should destroy Muslim terrorism. I was like behind this whole thing because yeah, I agree. And I, I, I was there politically. Uh, then I became a social democrat, and I started to realize that oh shit, there are like, there are people that are oppressed. There are people that are oppressors. I guess this uh -huh. is like this is uh, this is when I realized, for example, race relations in America. I was like, yeah, I get it now. Uh, yeah. But then I, I got the but I didn't get that there were some material conditions behind it. I got that there is a history. I knew that the, like there is some stuff that is happening behind the scenes that I don't know, and there could be some conspiracy or something, you know, against people, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then I became a Marxist, and this is when the dialectics kicked in. Dialectics were put in motion, <laughs> and uh, I saw the imperialism, I saw uh, the oppression of capitalism, and I saw the why and how it is happening. And uh, I think mm -hmm. this is just looking at things dialectically is really really important i completely agree with you yes it's like um it's like kafka makes it it's like kafka criticizing like the business realm um mm -hmm. the bureaucracy of it all i guess you could say is more oppressing it it, it it takes the people who are in power even and supposed power and they're powerless against the bureaucracy uh, it's yeah. the system itself becomes in itself the oppressor, and we are all just actors in inside of this uh, little chasm that we've created for ourselves, and it's not necessarily anyone's fault. Um, I agree. To yeah. quote Khrushchev, to quote Khrushchev, uh, to play with wolves, you have to be a wolf. Mm -hmm. Like basically, this is how he. This is a good example of why revisionism in Soviet Union happened. Like. They were all a part of the system, and they just played their role. You just have to be one, one with the system, one with the same with everyone else, and cutthroats because it's a cutthroat system. Like yeah. this is what why it happened, and I completely agree. Well, dude, we went on for two hours. We thought it will be one hour shorter. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, what? Well, wasn't there supposed to be more people on here? Like, no, it's usually just um, me, some other guy, and uh, the, the chat. So that's it. Oh, okay. That was pretty so, chill. <laughs> you were expecting someone else? No, no, no. I thought there just was going to be bumping. like... Um, well, usually there's like at least three people. Oh, that's just podcast. pain. For me, it's just pain. Uh, we used to do the podcast with three people, but because of technical yeah. difficulties, uh, we thought like we should do just me and a co-host. And the streams uh, that we do regularly every week, Bolshevik Bistro on Wednesday and Book Club every month, uh, <laughs> they are me and some other guests. Because it's I, I really like to talk to different people. I really like to expand on the subject. And I think a dialogue plus chat is just perfect for that. So, yeah. This was actually really, it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Yeah. I would love to th have you on on some other day on some other topic. So we should talk about it. Like, uh, before we finish, let me give another thanks to our Patreons. You're fucking amazing. My fucking gun. Let me check whether we hit 200 subs. It's very important. 
No. Okay. 199. <laughs> oh, okay. Dude. Consider subscribing and uh, please share this thing around. I love you very much. We love you. Uh, we haven't got a podcast last week because we have a really fucking big thing coming up. And I'll share it with you tomorrow. Hopefully, if I'll be able to upload on time. We have a really big project that I'm really happy to show you tomorrow. So stick around for that. And on this note, uh, also, a couple again, don't forget, in, in the uh, description of this video and audio on our iTunes and SoundCloud, you can see the links to Crossroads Discord server, um, Zapatista, Cafe Zapatista, you're carrying, share, they, jo they don't need a lot of money, so share your five bucks or something, if you have it, don't support us, but you support them. Uh, also, the book club was New Socialism by Paul Cockshot and Alan Cortell, 8th of September, PDF link is in the description, SoundCloud and iTunes, follow us there. And uh, our email is emailpodcast.gmail.com. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at email Eugene. On this note, I'd like to say goodbye to you, Chad. Goodbye to our subscribers and listeners. And goodbye to you, Max. See ya. All right. Goodbye. It's a pretty good chat. Yeah. <laughs>